Well, hello everyone. Welcome to another online service here at ABF, Agora Bible Fellowship. My name is Chris, and I'm one of the pastors here. And I just have a couple things for you to draw to your attention uh, before we get into God's Word. The first thing is here at ABF, we love praying for you. So if you have a prayer request, uh, we would love to partner with you in prayer. So you can text your prayer request to 97,000. Again, that's 97,000. And uh, we get those prayer requests. They're confidential. And uh, we just really find it to be an honor to, to, to pray for you through the week. So please, please utilize that. Uh, the second thing is we have a lot going on here uh, at the church. A lot of ministries from our children's to our student ministries, junior high, high school, men's and women's ministries and seniors like you. You think of it, we have it uh, pretty much. So there's just a lot happening. The best way for you to find information about all of those events and happenings is at our website at agorabible.org. And also on there, uh, you can see that there's a give tab. There's no way that we can do what we do here at the church with all of our ministries without your uh, ongoing generosity. So uh, we would love and just be a, so appreciative if you would uh, just pray about what uh, that looks like for you. And uh, we would just be so uh, so thankful for any uh, gifts that way. Well, again, thank you so much. And without further ado, let's dig into God's Word. In 1845, the ill-fated Franklin expedition sailed from England to find passage across the Arctic Ocean. The crew loaded their two sailing ships with lots of stuff they didn't need. A 1,200-volume library, fine china, crystal goblets, and sterling silverware for each officer on the ship with their initials engraved on the handles. Amazingly, each ship took only a 12-day supply of coal for their auxiliary steam engines. Unfortunately, the, st the ships became trapped in a vast frozen plain of ice and they were stuck. And after several months, Lord Franklin died. So the men decided to trek to safety in small groups, but none of them survived. One story is especially heartbreaking. Two officers pulled a large sled more than 65 miles across the treacherous ice. When rescuers found them and their bodies, they discovered that the sled was filled with expensive table silverware. Those men contributed to their own demise by carrying what they didn't need. In a word, they were carrying excess baggage. And that, my friends, is what we do in life as well. This, this season, these next five weeks, we're going to look at a topic called summer baggage. Today, we'll look at the baggage of bitterness. And then in succeeding weeks, we'll look at jealousy, pride, negativity, and fear. And so I want to ask you a question do you carry any baggage in your life? I think we all carry some kind of baggage, but we might be surprised that maybe the baggage of bitterness is something we carry more than we thought. So let's just jump right to it. Hopefully you've downloaded the notes and uh, welcome to those of you who are watching online or after the service and you're watching it a second time. Let's look at this topic together. Let's look at the condition of bitterness. And of course, the verse we have to go to is Hebrews 12, 15. It says this, See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by many become defiled. So let's look at the definition of bitterness. The classic definition is anger and disappointment at being treated unfairly in a word, resentment. It is a basic human reaction in responses to experiences like injustice, betrayal, and humiliation. Maybe a simpler definition is this. Bitterness is a chronic and pervasive state of smoldering resentment. You get that idea, the idea of a campfire. You're going to put the fire out for the night, and you have some coals that are kind of smoldering, and you're shocked that it's still burning the next morning when you wake up. So bitterness is the result of a feeling that we have when we've been hurt, and we understand that. Somehow, uh, when we've not been treated fairly, and the people or persons responsible have not been dealt with or had to pay for it or owned up to it, it hurts us. And in fact, some people will become bitter, and because of this woundedness or feeling cheated or neglected or dismissed, 
this idea of experiencing such great loss causes them to wonder, how in the world can I unload this baggage of bitterness that I have been carrying for so long? Now, in our text, it mentions this idea of a root of bitterness. Be careful about letting that grow in your life. So this idea of a seed of offense, when we let bitterness grow to the point it develops a root system in our soul, that becomes a problem. Because the roots of uh, bitterness, which are in our soul, are like this tree that you see on the screen with uh, roots that went deep, and then it caused the sidewalk around it to crack. And so though it does its damage internally, it eventually comes out externally. And so as it grows, it becomes stronger. And just like a tree with these massive roots, it can destroy a sidewalk, and bitterness can destroy our life. So it's a dangerous root with a poisonous fruit. Write that phrase down. It's a dangerous root with a poisonous fruit. Another way of looking at bitterness is the porcupine. Now, I don't have a picture of a porcupine, but we get the idea. They have a lot of fine points, but they're very hard to get close to. And they're hard to get close to because bitter people are harsh, they're critical, they're unforgiving, they're judgmental, they're sarcastic, and oftentimes angry. And so if we think about bitterness properly, we've got to release it. We've got to get, let go of it. So bitterness is like taking poison and hoping your enemy will die. Think about that. Bitterness is like taking poison and hoping your enemy will die. Well, let's describe it. What are the situations that we may feel bitter about, things that we've gone through in life? And maybe this applies to you. Maybe some of them do. Maybe some of them don't. How about this? Has anyone ever abused you physically or emotionally? Or worse, has someone done these kinds of things to someone you love, like your kids or your spouse? Did your father or mother in your family of origin have an affair and cause your family to be blown up? And so that implosion as a young child or as an adult has caused you to lack trust in families and trust relationships. Or maybe even worse, your spouse has cheated on you. Has someone, maybe even a friend, lied or gossiped or spread rumors about you? It's easy to get bitter about that. Or how about a family member stealing from you? This is somewhat common, unfortunately, when family estates are divided up and the ex executor of the will doesn't really take care of business. And Maybe uh, you feel like your former business partner in a different realm may have taken advantage of you. How about this one? You've been denied a promotion because of nepotism or office politics. And if you were ever fired unjustly at a job or you had a boss that yelled and demeaned you, then maybe you understand this idea of bitterness. The story is told of bitterness developed in a friendship between Michelangelo, who was a painter who fancied himself as a sculptor, and the famous Raphael, who was a renowned sculptor. Both of them did their jobs very, very well, but they had very different tasks. Both of them were highly regarded in their own particular fields, but interestingly, a bitterness broke out between them because of their rivalry. And so whenever they would pass each other in the hall or even meet, they refused to speak to each other. Everybody around them could see it. It was obvious. This bitterness was well known and seen by all. The ironic thing is that both of them did their work as unto God for the glory of God. And so while they are bitter towards each other they're, and holding on to this, Unfortunately, what happened was it didn't end well for them. When people are like that, when they're revered and renowned and that bitterness and that rivalry is seen by others outside their relationship, it causes conflict with so many other people as well. The other famous example is between Winston Churchill, who everybody knows, and somebody that you may not have heard of, but a rivalry he had with a woman named Lady Astor. And they would often say snarky, mean-spirited things to each other, even put each other down. 
And it got to be really, really bad. So on one occasion, Lady Astor said to Winston Churchill publicly, she said, sir, if you were my husband, I would put poison in your tea. Unfazed by that, Winston Churchill turned to her and said, Madame, if I were your husband, I would drink that tea. We, we laugh about that, but that is a descriptor of what bitterness can do in a relationship. So what is the downside? If we look at it clinically, chronic bitterness or embitterment is seen in about 3% of the population. In fact, there's a word for it. It's called post-traumatic embitterment disorder, PTED. And this fear or hatred that's also coupled with this desire to get revenge or fantasies of, of revenge is a real thing. And so one singular traumatic event experienced as insulting or humiliating or being unjust can send someone in this downward spiral that they just can't get out of, kind of like a plane who's in a downward spiral and the pilot can't right the ship, so to speak. Now, I would say that kind of bitterness that we hold deep inside of us, maybe for years or months, is like an iceberg. You see this picture here. See, the problem is not with the tip of the iceberg. You can see that. It's what's going on underneath the iceberg that often would cause a ship like the Titanic, for instance, to uh, crash. And the real problem is what's going on in the surface of your life. What's really happening to you? Here's a quote. Or here's an idea. Most people say they know a bitter person. Few are willing to admit that they are the bitter person. You see, some of you today are saying, I'm not bitter. It's not me. I don't have a problem. But on further reflection, maybe you're dealing with this more than you realize. And so I think more people struggle with bitterness than they're willing to admit to. So what is the cause of bitterness? I'm going to give you three simple causes to bitterness. It's not, the list is not exhaustive, but we see the base of this from Proverbs 4.23. It says, guard your hearts with all diligence, for out of it flows the issues of life. See, ultimately, the cause of bitterness is a heart issue, and that heart issue has to be dealt with. And I would suggest that these three things might be a cause of your bitterness or my bitterness. Number one is when you are wounded, when you are wounded, you have this unresolved past trauma and you're feeling in, invalidated, unappreciated, oftentimes caustic friendships, toxic friendships, people who are betrayal, uh, betraying you, who have been disloyal to you. Uh, you feel like they're your friend, but man, they don't act like it. And it can be it's very little. Maybe someone unfriends you on Facebook or they don't like your post on your Instagram stream or whatever. Um, and so oftentimes this comes out in crazy family systems ways and there's family dysfunction that causes these constant repercussions of being wounded. Secondly, and a kissing cousin to being wounded is being wronged. This unforgiveness towards a person because of what they did to you. So person A did what to person B? And Person B holds on to that grudge, that resentment, that bitterness. And a lot of times that's tied to them being criticized by this other person. Their critical judgmentalism or this idea of being continually humiliated. Some of you, as I talk about bitterness, it drudges up horrible memories of being in junior high or high school and being bullied. I think if anybody in this room or watching this sermon has gone through that, my heart goes out to you. Because I know when you have felt bullied, um, it's a defeating uh, feeling in your life. Um, I'm interested to see what happens because there were the haves and the have-nots in high school. And this coming fall, I'll be going to my 50th high school reunion. You looking at me on tape go, dang, John, you are old, aren't you? And yeah, I've earned every one of these 50 post-high school years. And in my 68th year, what I realize is, you know what? I'm so happy that I have no baggage from that area or period of my life, no regrets. And I'm looking forward to seeing those friends. But that's not true for all of us, is it? 
thirdly, uh, bitterness is caused by just being willful. In other words, you choose to feed that negativity, those negative emotions. And so what happens is when you're perpetually uh, bitter, you then play the victim role. You play the victim card. You're always the victim, so therefore you can justify your anger, your resentment, and of course, it's always somebody else's fault. In fact, bitterness is really a form of pride because bitterness begins to germinate when something happens to you so that you don't think you deserve it. And you mutter to yourself, I don't deserve this. I don't know why this has happened to me. Um, it reminds me of the funny story of, of a student who went to his professor in college really angry, very really ticked off because the professor gave him a zero on a test. And he said, hey, uh, can I talk to you, sir? Um, excuse me, but I don't think I deserve this zero. The professor said, you know what? I agree with you. You don't deserve it, but it's the lowest grade I could give you. <laughs> we, we look at that and say, oh, that wasn't the answer that he hoped for. And oftentimes in life when we're bitter, I don't know what we hope to accomplish with holding on to bitterness because it certainly doesn't work. There's another illustration I'd love to share with you about bitterness indirectly. A woman came home one day and found her four children huddled in the den around something very interesting. She tiptoed over to see that it was what it was, and she saw that her kids had brought in four baby skunks into the house, and she's admire, they're admiring them on the floor. She screamed and frightened the kids and said, children, the, the children, run, run. The children said, Mom, what's the matter? She said, just run. Get outside as fast as you can. And so the children obeyed perfectly. However, each one took a skunk with them as they ran out the house. You see, sometimes we do just that. In our attempt to deal with bitterness, we just take it along with us. And when trying to escape that hurt or betrayal or trauma, we end up taking the problems or troubles with us. And so... That's what happens to a person who becomes bitter. You can't win a right from it. And no matter what you do or where you go, you can't let go of it unless you make a conscious effort to let go of it. So what's the good news today? Well, I think the good news is there is a cure for bitterness. And let's start with Matthew 5, 9 as the overreaching principle. It says this, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. We just looked at that. Uh, passage just a few weeks ago here at church. And the idea is that peacemaking is hard work. And it is something that's essential because bitterness always has a lack of peace component to it, usually hostility towards another person. So how do we combat bitterness? I want to give you three real practical suggestions this morning or tonight or whenever you're watching this. Number one, consider your life first. Romans 12, 18. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Romans 12, 18. Now you say, I got to deal with bitterness and I got to start by looking inward at me? Look at my life? Yeah, we need to consider the things that maybe we've done wrong uh, to other people before we start thinking about who's wronged us and how they need to ask for forgiveness for their wrong. Here's the principle. We may be the cause of someone else's bitterness. And that's why the scripture says that if you know someone has something against you, lay your offering down at the altar and go and make it right with the other person. And I'll be honest with you. I, I don't really struggle with bitterness. So I thought, man, I'm preaching on this topic how in the world does this apply to me? And the Lord gave me something in an indirect way or a direct way just a few weeks ago. I was preaching at a, at a former church a few weeks ago. I get done. It was well received. People were lined up to talk to me because I had been their junior high pastor years ago in Huntington Beach. So this was over 40 years ago. And a couple want to see me at the very end and they're very polite. But the man came up and said, I'm really, really mad and upset with you. I kind of thought he was kidding, right? I mean, but he's not kidding. And I said, what's wrong? He said, you didn't treat my wife very nicely when you were on staff here. 
And you said some unkind things one time, one time in a conversation. Now, I had no idea what he was referring to. I had no recollection of the conversation. I immediately owned it and said, I, I, I'm, that's wrong. I, whatever I said, that was wrong. We got to go make this right with your wife. And so he brought me over to her and I said, I understand that we had a conversation years ago that really offended you. I had no idea. I apologize. I was wrong. Would you forgive me? And she, you could just see her shoulders go, yes, I forgive you. And so forgiveness was extended, but here's what's ironic. They carried that for some 40 years, and I had no idea I was a cause of that embitterment. And so it's a cautionary tale. We might want to say whatever we've done to someone else is just a minor thing, but we need to own up to it. And I'm glad to say I did, and, and we're okay. I just wish it wouldn't have taken 40 years. So be honest with God about any bitter feelings now on the flip side of that that you've been harboring towards somebody else. And I think that's a harder evaluation because bitterness is so buried deep inside of you, you keep it covered up and you've done all kinds of workarounds until it sometimes bubbles out uh, and bubbles up in your life. So I think that bitterness has less to do with the magnitude of the offense than the proximity of the offender. Hear that again. Bitterness has less to do with the magnitude of the offense than to the proximity of the offender. That's why little sharp pricks from a spouse or a loved one are far more damaging than some huge insult by someone you don't even know uh, that you, you in some public situation. And so when you see that person who has wounded you and you haven't forgiven them and that bitterness is festering inside your soul, then the offense grows and grows. Kind of like uh, the yeast when my wife has that starter thing in the, in the glass and out comes eventually uh, sourdough bread when she bakes it. It just keeps growing. The second thing is we got to call on God to be their judge. Don't hold a grudge. Got that? Rhymes, doesn't it? God, call on God to be their judge. Don't hold a grudge. Look at this verse, Romans 12, verses 17 to 19. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it's written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. It says something similar in Hebrews 10, Verses 30 and 31, for we know him who said, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So God is the judge. And the problem is we want to be the judge. We want to be the executioner. We want to take revenge. So do you ever fear that the person who did you wrong has gotten away with it? We kind of feel that the evil doer will slip into the night, unknown, unpunished, and escapes to Fiji to sip drinks on the beach, and we're left holding this poisonous bag of bitterness. And then we think like this, after what that person did to me, isn't there some vengeance in order, and we get all high and mighty, and of course it is. Of course, we want vengeance. But the fact is, God cares about justice more than, than we do. So you got to take a deep breath. Interesting enough, if we look back at both of those passages, it says that God will repay, not that he might repay. The problem is, his timetable is never our timetable. And ultimately, we're waiting to see justice to be served if the truth be known. An interesting study would be Dave, David's imprecatory psalms. There's 13 of them in the book of Psalms. Psalms 5, 10, 17, 35, 58, 59, 69, 70, 79, 83, 109, 129, 137, and 140. Whoo! Here's an interesting observation. David's prayers were not for personal vindication. 
It was not for personal vindication. These imprecatory prayers are that God's justice would be carried out. Let me just give you three quick examples. Let's look at the screen. Let's look at the verses. In Psalm 5.10, make them bear their guilt, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels because of the abundance of their transgressions. Cast them out, for they have rebelled against you. You see, David is the collateral damage in that. He wants God to take care, a.k.a. slay the evildoers. How about Psalm 17, verse 13? Arise, O Lord, confront him, subdue him, deliver my soul from the wicked by your sword. In other words, God, you got to fight my battles. I can't, t- I can't deal with this anymore. Or Psalm 79, verses 6 and 7. Pour out your anger on the nations that do not know you and on the kingdoms that do not call upon your name, for they have devoured Jacob and laid waste his habitation. And so that's a, a national justice that David's calling on as well. So here's a thought. You take care of you. You know, it's exhausting. It's exhausting to hold on to a grudge. You can't control what other people do, but you can control your response. Easier said than done, but let's just do this. You take care of you. Thirdly, and this is the ultimate solution, is we have to choose to forgive the offense. Look at Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And instead, what do we substitute? And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. With bitterness, I think that's the capstone. Look at that, what follows in the trail of bitterness. When you have bitterness, there's usually then following it at wrath and anger and clamor and evil deeds. And so Ephesians 4.31 says, put them aside, Put them away. Put them to death. Get rid of them. So forgiveness really is the only way that you can stop this vicious cycle of bitterness, of blame, of blame and pain. And if God can forgive my sin, could we maybe extend grace and forgiveness to someone else? How about this from Colossians 3.13? Bear with each other and forgive one another If any of you have a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Same song, second verse. I love what Max Lucado says about forgiveness. He says, forgiveness is unlocking the door to set someone else free and realizing you were the prisoner. Now, I want to be quick to say that when we're talking about forgiveness, I am not saying these four things. Write these down. I'm not saying this. I'm not saying, oh, just get over your hurt. Grieving is not a sin, friend. And I realize some of you have been grieving and and your hurt is real and hurting is not a sin. Both are a part of being human. So it's not wrong to hurt, but however, it is wrong to hate. The second thing I'm not saying is, oh, just forgive and forget. Que sera, sera. No, forgiveness is free, but trust has to be earned. For instance, I can forgive a thief, yet it doesn't mean I'm giving the keys to my car and to my house. Number three, I'm not saying you have to become best friends with the person who hurt you so deeply. It is okay to have appropriate boundaries that continue, so you're not continually put in harm's way. And for some of you, your family is so dysfunctional that you've had to kind of step back and put up some boundaries because maybe it's your parents that have continually hurt you and now you're an adult in your 40s or 50s and you've just realized they're not safe. Now, I'm not picking on parents. In fact, I'm not picking on anybody, but I do realize there are times that there are toxic people in your life and you've just got to be you know, take a step back and you don't have to be best friends with them. Then lastly, forgiveness is not enabling another uh, person to repeat the offense. In other words, letting that same offense go over and over again. This is a very touchy subject, but I know some of you may have been molested by a parent. It's It's a sad, sad thing. Or you were molested by a relative, for instance. That doesn't mean that you have to be in relationship with them or allow your kids to be obviously babysat by them uh, as you move forward. 
there are probably other things that you have to just create a boundary and realize that that enabling of that person to hurt you over and over again is not what God meant by turn the other cheek. Sometimes we say, here's another thought, that I've forgiven them, but I'm never really going to forget. So when we say that, we're essentially saying, I'm not going to be the executioner, but I am going to be the judge. I'm not going to, I'm going to condemn you and I'm going to sentence you, but I'm not going to hurt you back. I'm going to harbor in my heart what you did, and even though I'm not going to act out, I'm going to hold on to it. Friends, do you see how wacky that is? That is a classic example of bitterness. You've got to let go eventually. Not forgive and forget in just a case or a way, but you have to let forgiveness wash over you and release you from that pain. Now, I think there's a phenomenal example of that in the, in the Old Testament of forgiveness. A guy who had every right to be bitter. In fact, we did a whole series on his life called Plot Twist, and that is Joseph. He had a choice to rehearse it and relive it or release it and replace it. Did you get that? He had a choice, and so do you, to rehearse it and relive it or release it and replace it. And he chose the latter. Even all the things that his brothers had done to him. It comes down to that fulcrum in Genesis 50, 20, 50, 20, when he summarizes his whole life and it says, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. Those are great words. And so I'll close with these two points. Forgiveness is not based on fairness. In Victor Hugo's Les Mis, Jean Valjean is put to prison for 19 years for stealing a loaf of bread so he can feed his family. By the time he gets out, he's a bitter, hardened criminal, and in a way, his life to bondage to bitterness and hate caused him to struggle, and he comes out with no place to live. He's homeless, and he's a criminal. But a very kind bishop in the church invites him to stay at his home, and that night, Valjean decides to steal the silverware from the bishop's house and run away. But he's captured by the police. They're pretty sp suspicious why a homeless guy is carrying a bag of so many valuables. And the police bring Valjean to the bishop and ask whether Valjean stole the silverware. The response of the bishop is shockingly powerful. And if you've seen the, the movie or the play, it's powerful. He could have said yes. He could have sent... Valjean back to jail and hardening his heart even more. But the bishop said this. It's a classic line. He said, so good to see you, friend. Why did you leave without saying goodbye? Why did you forget to take the candlesticks? And he gives the silver candlestick to Valjean. Valjean is so literally flabbergasted. He's shocked. And after the police leaves, he breaks down in tears. And the bishop shows him grace and forgives him, even though Valjean doesn't deserve it. That, my friends, is gospel transformation. That's the grace that we extend to people. That's the, the grace and the forgiveness that breaks the bond of bitterness and the baggage of bitterness that you've been carrying. And I'll close with this. There's always a cost for forgiveness. You've got to be willing to absorb the debt. When you forgive, the debt just doesn't disappear into thin air. You transfer the debt. You're willing to absorb the cost because you're willing to bear the cost of forgiveness to the person who offended you. Now, as I close, this is really personal. And I've hesitated to tell this story, but I'm going to do it because it's my story of dealing with bitterness in my own life. Several years ago, I left a church in Minnesota to come back to California. And I left because of circumstances surrounding the senior pastor that I served with. And without getting all the details, uh, there was a conflict and it wasn't resolved. And I left, to be honest with you, on my own accord, but I was bitter, kind of looking over my shoulder. That bitterness was inflamed when a few months later, 
I had heard that that senior pastor that I had a conflict was eventually terminated because he was having an affair with the secretary at that church. And so I felt pretty emboldened. See, that guy was wacky. That was all his fault. The conflict was all on his shoulders. Uh, he mistreated me. All the things I've been talking about during this sermon. Well, a few years later, former chairman of the board at the time and I came across each other's path and he said, hey, why don't you call, why don't you call him? I won't mention his name. Why don't you call him? And why would I call him? He says, I think you have some unfinished business. I go, I have no unfinished business. This was all his fault. I got nothing to hide, nothing to, he was at blame. And you can, can you see that self-righteous defensiveness? He said, well, and he just slid a piece of paper over the table. Said, There's his cell phone. I said, begrudgingly, well, okay. I'll pray about it. Next month we were in a meeting. He said, uh, well, what are you going to do? And he goes, all right, Peter, I'll call him. So that was in November of a, of a year. And I called him. I said, hey, I'm going to be in Orlando in February speaking at a conference. On my way from the conference to the airport, could we grab lunch? And so we did. And I don't know what I was expecting. I think inwardly I was hoping he would just fess up and ask forgiveness for what he had done. But what God had worked in my heart over those months was I was the problem. I needed to own my stuff regardless of what he owned. And so I said, John, would you forgive me for my judgmental, prideful, embittered spirit that I had towards you? And of course he said, of course I will. Now, this is where you hope that that other person then says, and would you forgive me for blah, blah, blah. You know what? That never happened. But I can tell you this, friends, Getting the bag of bitterness off my shoulder and dealing with me, regardless of his response and what he was going to own, was so freeing, and it's changed my life. Because I have nobody that I look back at with bitterness, and it was like I was set free. And so I want you to bow your heads, close your eyes, and pray with me as, as we apply our text this morning. Heavenly Father, as we pray right now, I would ask that we would release the bag of bitterness that we may be carrying. No matter how big or how small, that as we start this series, summer baggage, that the first thing we unload is the baggage of bitterness. In Jesus' name, amen.